Well, thanks for staying. First of all, how was the lunch? Did you enjoy the lunch? If you have any complaints, please let Don know. Uh, if you have any recommendations, uh, you could let Joanne know, so, uh, or, or any of us. But uh, that was great. Thanks for the idea. And Joanne, thanks for all the hard work. She said don't acknowledge her, but she's doing it. Uh, if there's any able-bodied people that want to help a little bit, Brian's already volunteered. Uh, help clean up afterwards, that would be great as well. But thank you for that. So uh, you can also, as this goes on, ask a new questions. So uh, the first question that I'm going to ask that somebody said is, Kirby, could you tell us how you and Suzanne met? <laughs> well, that one seems pretty simple, but I'll take the easy one here. And that is uh, Suzanne is uh, um, from Oregon State, and so was I at the time. So I had dated her roommate. We've known each other for quite some time. Suzanne was telling Molly the whole story about the fact that uh, she never dated me because I had uh, three strikes against me. Number one, she's a year older than I am, so I was an underclassman. Number two, um, I was from California, so that's a, definitely a strike. And number three, uh, she figured she was going into ministry and I wasn't, so three strikes and you're out. Now, how in the world did we end up? Well, when she went off to um, Campus Crusade for Christ, now called Crew, her training was at Purdue. That was one of the few times that you know, the institute was taking place at the university. And so I had somehow gotten her email and sent her some material. But she also then was actually being educated. You know, I talked about 50 years ago, Jimmy Williams and John Buell started Probe. And um, it was interesting because Jimmy Williams, though he had left Campus Crusade was still a teacher. So four of the classes Suzanne took were from Jimmy Williams, and he's uh, talking about this idea of starting probe ministries and having us address issues and prepare kids for college, all the kinds of things we were doing. And she said, you know, my friend Kirby Anderson, he was vice president of the student body, and he oftentimes would speak on these issues. He might be interested. Send it to me. That probably was the end of it, she thought, but it was actually the beginning of it, because eventually, later on, as she was uh, raising support, I visited her occasionally, and Again, had no interest because she was focused. Uh, my wife has a bird dog point on things, you know, so if she's on and she's raising support, that's it. Uh, nothing else. And finally, her mother just said, I do not understand you because, you know, you're not interested in Kirby. Well, I'm interested in raising my support. I'm not worried about that. And Pat Party said something that I don't think you ever would have heard ever again. And that is, well, if I were your age and I knew Kirby, I'd be interested. And it was like, you know, the E.F. Hutton commercial. He said, what? You know, so, and so I was pre-approved by the mother-in-law. And so as a result, that was the case. So, yeah. Uh, so that's, that's a short story of how, how we met. But we got better questions to ask than that one. Do, do, you need, do you need rebuttal time, Suzanne? Or is that, okay. It's, okay. Uh, how would you, these, I'm going to try to wrap these two together. How would you explain or justify the historicity and reliability of the Bible to a non-believer? And similarly, how would you reason for somebody who is uh, far gone on a secular basis, maybe CRT? Right. Could good. you maybe wrap those two together? Well, again, if you want to talk about the Bible, that is certainly the case. Uh, I've been um, making available some of the booklets, but we have one, for example, on Messianic prophecy. We have another one, archaeology. So, again, I think there are different kinds of arguments, and it's amazing to me. Messianic prophecy is one of those, and that is you have all these prophecies in the Old Testament. We know they were written down in the Old Testament. We have the Dead Sea Scrolls, so nobody can say that they changed it later on. So we can see that these were prophecies written down, pointing to the Messiah, and um, there are hundreds of them fitting into about 70 categories, and all of them were literally fulfilled in one individual, Jesus Christ. So the uh, issue of um, basically fulfilled prophecy is a very powerful argument. I was at the National Religious Broadcasters recently and met somebody that works in broadcasting. He said, that's what caused me to become a Christian. How did all these prophecies actually come fulfilled in one individual? So that, I think, is a powerful argument, especially for our Jewish friends. And I know you all probably have some Jew secular Jewish friends. That can be a really powerful argument. And so that is maybe one that's sort of a, an internal argument 
argument, but then the external argument gets back to the issue of archaeology, and that is anybody that says, well, I think there are uh, errors in the Bible, historical errors, well, again, archaeology, this has been, as I was sharing with a few of you, this is a golden age of archaeology right now. I mean, when you have William Albright and some of those individuals developing all the archaeological finds that confirm the historical accuracy, primarily of the Old Testament, they, they have um, really started the foundation. But what has exploded in the last couple of years are the fact that not only are we finding more archaeological finds, but ones that we've found, we now have the technology to read. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of people say, well, do we even know that Pontius Pilate lived. Well, if you go to Caesarea Maritima, you actually have a, a sculpture there, or actually a plate that says that. Of course, you can see the original in the Israeli museum. But over there at the Herodium, they've now found a ring. They've had the ring for years, but now they can read that it says Pontius Pilate on the ring. Now, it doesn't mean that he wore it. Most likely, it's the kind of ring that one of his associates wore to show that he had the power of the Roman Empire. But that's the case. Uh, there is a book that uh, has come out in the last couple of years by these scholars on looking at all the historical accuracy of the book of Acts. It's a really hard to read book. I've said before that if you have any trouble with insomnia, just put it at your bedside, you know, two pages in and you're out. But <laughs> nevertheless, these really bright individuals say that all sorts of uh, supposed errors that were made by Luke, because again, if you can take down Luke, you can take down a lot because you got the gospel of Luke and you also have what? The book of Acts. Well, now they're saying, nope, the skeptics are wrong and Luke was right. He was historically accurate in so many different ways. So I think those are some really compelling arguments for individuals. Now, I still think the most compelling argument we find in 1 Corinthians 15, don't we? And that is the resurrection. I still recognize that there are people that won't listen to that. But the bottom line is, as we, I think today have so so many great books that have come out. Body of Proof is the new book out by Dr. Jeremiah Johnston. Go all the way back to Josh McDowell and a variety of others. Elise Strobel, Case for Christ. I mean, the evidence for the resurrection is so great. And it's, of course, the thing that basically the Apostle Paul says, if the resurrection is true, then our faith is good. If the resurrection is false, then our faith is worthless and we are to be pitied. So I think those are some arguments. But even if you don't get to the resurrection, people have to make their peace with this idea of fulfilled prophecy. You don't have anything like that with Nostradamus or Gene Dixon or the horoscope or anything like that. There's nothing even close to that in ancient literature. Uh, there is one place where Muhammad claims that there's a statement by Jesus that he's the fulfillment of. I think you can set that one aside. So nothing is like fulfilled prophecy except what you find in the Old and New Testament. And I think it's something that we should always focus on, not that I'm telling Bayside not to talk about prophecy, but you know, 27% of the Bible when written was prophetic in nature. A large portion of that, especially most of those Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled uh, in the life of Jesus or in events that took place over time. So that tells us the rest of those probably will be fulfilled as well. So I think that's a very powerful argument and is very useful and helpful, especially when you're talking to your Jewish friends. But if they have questions about the historical accuracy of the Bible, it's really hard to make that case with a straight face now because archaeology has become the friend of us. And um, if you ever get to the Museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C., there's a whole section, because I think it's on the second floor, which just establishes time and time again how archaeology has confirmed the historical accuracy of the Bible. So next one. Yeah, a quick follow up. Uh, so if you had a short conversation with a non-believer, uh, would the first easiest thing to do, because this is what both Lee Strobel and then like Jay Werner Wallace with the cold case, they focused on the resurrection to disprove right. Christian. Would the easy thing to do if somebody, the people who asked these questions were trying to engage somebody is, well, let's look at the resurrection. You'd agree that if Jesus raised, rose from the dead uh, and maybe just answer that on a, a practical 
you got 30 minutes with somebody or a little bit yep. of time, how you would do it. Yeah, that's a good point. Because again, if you do the resurrection, uh, as you just pointed out, Jay Warner Wallace and Sean McDowell and Josh McDowell and uh, Lee Strobel and of course this new one that just came out with uh, Jeremiah Johnston are all just great resources. And uh, I think part of it, the question is, would you believe that, would you agree that if we could prove that, that you would pay attention? Because it reminds me of an old R.C. Sproul story years ago where at one point he had this individual who says, you know, there's so many Bible, uh, errors in the Bible. And R.C. Sproul said, well, okay, um, can we kind of create a list of what you think are errors in the Bible? So he pulls out a notepad like you did, and they're writing them down, and he's giving a reasonable answer to every one of those alleged contradictions in the Bible. And I would recommend that uh, maybe Norm Geiser's book, you know, Bible, di or his book, or, or maybe uh, Bible Difficulties by Gleason Archer, any of those are good answers. And at the end, he said, well, haven't I answered your questions? And the guy looks at me and says, well, R.C., you know there are errors in the Bible. So, you know, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can tell people that, look, I can give you evidence for the resurrection, but bottom line is, if you aren't going to believe at the end, why am I going to waste my time? You know, that's an issue. But what would you say? First of all, I think you can say historically, we can all agree with the fact that Jesus was crucified. Everybody can pretty much agree with that, that he was taken down, he was placed in a tomb, and we can also agree that the tomb was empty. And now they start, well, trying to get some answers to how that happens. And one of the answers would be, well, the disciples went to the wrong tomb. Okay, the women went to the wrong tomb, the disciples went to the wrong tomb, the Romans went to the wrong tomb, Joseph of Marathia didn't wear, know where his tomb is. Does that make any sense? No, that didn't make any sense. Okay. You had the so-called uh, Passover plot that Jesus didn't die on the cross. He just swooned, and eventually he wakes up, um, and he's just covered with all these uh, ar aromatic spices and uh, various kinds of uh, wrappings and things like that. So he hops over to the uh, tomb, pushes away a two and a half ton rock, and then fights off all the Roman guards, and then appears to his disciples as war Lord of Life. Does that make any sense? And I always like to say, have you ever seen the passion of the Christ? You know, I, one of our DTS professors was there with another DTS professor when they were watching that. And one guy, one of the professors turned to the other and said, do you think it was that bad? And the other professor said, it was probably worse than what's on the screen. And then to believe that somebody, you know, just sort of passed out and then woke up again in the tomb, that doesn't make any sense. And so you have to deal with the fact that you have the death of Jesus. It was validated by the Roman guards. He was placed into a tomb. There was a rock before the tomb, there, a stone before the tomb. There were uh, Romans. And then you have all the different appearances. And I, on our website, we have a list of all of them. And you have some appearances to two people, the road to Emmaus. You have others to 11 of the disciples, others to not all the disciples. Thomas is not there. You have one place where he appears to 500, which eliminates another possible explanation, hallucination. You know, uh, some people said, well, they just wanted Jesus to live, so they hallucinated that he was alive. Does that make any sense? I mean, most of them didn't believe Jesus was going to rise from the dead, number one. Second of all, we know enough about hallucinations. Right now, as you're listening to me, some of you are hallucinating about going to the beach, you know, and you're not even paying attention. But is everybody having the same beach hallucination? No. 500 people eliminates that. So I can take you through every possible explanation that has come from skeptics and point out that every one of them doesn't make any sense. And as, um, of course, the famous book by Norm Geisler and Frank Turek, I don't have enough faith to believe, uh, you know, to be an atheist is a good example of that. You know, it takes really, I think, more faith to believe one of these attempts to explain the resurrection than to actually believe in the resurrection. So I would take somebody through a possible reality that historically know that Jesus died, the tomb was empty, there were these appearances. How do you explain that? And one last one, if I can give credit to Sean McDowell for just a minute, he did his doctrinal dissertation on what happened to the disciples. Now you've heard this before, that most of the disciples went out and died martyrs' deaths for something that they believed was true. 
Now, the bottom line is, if you believe that the disciples stole the body, which is what you have in, of course, Matthew's gospel, then you have to say, and nobody recanted. I mean, uh, he goes through in exquisite detail, which you don't want to hear about right after lunch, so we won't go into it, about how these martyrs died. And all but one, maybe John, died in exile in Patmos. So now we're starting to think maybe even he was executed as well. And not one of them recanted. Um, and you say, well, sometimes people die for a lie because they don't know it's a lie. Yeah, but you have to have the premise that they died for a lie and they knew it was a lie. And as Chuck Colson said, that's one of the reasons why I believed in the resurrection, because I was part of Watergate and we couldn't keep the story straight for about two weeks especially when John Dean started testifying. And so again, trying to keep a conspiracy together, it doesn't work very well. So those are a lot of ways you could argue the case if somebody really wanted to do that. And of course, there's just some wonderful books written over the years by skeptics who went out to try to prove the resurrection was false. Molly? Uh, Gary Habermas. And Gary Habermas, yeah. Matter of fact, Gary Habermas has written the introduction to the Jeremiah Johnston book, you know, just a little push for his book today. <laughs> Um, I think you or maybe Suzanne mentioned going to the Jesus Re Re um, Revolution film. Question, are young 20s and 30s not finding the gospel message enough, or are they looking for something more? After seeing the Jesus Revolution with our daughter, she asked us, where are all those Christians now? Yeah. Comments? Yeah, very good. And again, if you've not seen the film Jesus Revolution, interestingly enough, that is done by the Irwin brothers. Now, I've known the Irwin brothers for some time because one of our key supporters at Point of View Radio has also been the major financial backer for a lot of the Irwin brothers. And you probably are more familiar with, uh, uh, I can only imagine that film that came out, or American Underdog. And they've been wanting to do this Jesus Revolution film for years. And it's interesting because it's been seven years years in the making, and they finally concluded that maybe God had just had some roadblocks so that it would come out just as we were having these revivals at, you know, Asbury University, Cedarville University, Texas A&M, and a number of others, because we have some things going on in campus. But back to the point, you know, what happened to some of those individuals? Well, Chuck Smith's no longer alive, but interestingly enough, of course, Greg Laurie, what happened to him? Well, he's uh, probably the uh, best uh, example of a modern day Billy Graham, because we've done all sorts of things with Greg Laurie in Harvest Ministry. We've done very significant open air evangelistic crusades with him. Um, Suzanne and I were just talking about the fact near the end, you see the, the Expo 72. And Suzanne tells the story as a, a young college girl actually coming with a number of other Campus Crusade staff flying into Dallas and being part of that. And you had uh, Billy Graham and Bill Bright and um, Johnny Cash and you had Love Song Music Group and all sorts of individuals. And then as she got on a plane, she'd never been on a plane before. That's the first time she's ever on a plane. And she's flying out of Dallas. She looks out the window and says, goodbye, Dallas. I guess I'll never see you again. And of course, we live in Dallas, so that's fun. And the other day when we were doing a banquet with uh, Mike Huckabee, he gets up there and talks about Expo 72. So when he sits down, we said, you were at Expo 72? Yes, you were. It turns out he was actually a high school student and come with someone else. And so we have all sorts of individuals that were there, including Jerry Jenkins. I think most of you know Jerry Jenkins from the Left Behind series. And for those of you that love The Chosen, his son's name is Dallas Jenkins, and they named him Dallas because of the Dallas Expo. So that's a little trivia point that uh, most people don't know. So anyway, where are those individuals? Well, many of them are still involved in ministry. Uh, you saw well, Suzanne went and there was a, an event where they had, I think it was Paul Eshiman's wife, they had Josh McDowell and a number of other people that are still involved with Campus Crusade. And so where are they? Well, they're still out there doing a the ministry. But the reason they did this is they are really convinced that maybe we are on the edge of another possible revival. And I think we need more than just a revival. We need a reformation. We need a great awakening. Because my problem is that sometimes we have these great emotional experiences, nothing really changes. Um, I talked about race before. Here's a good example. 
We had the first great awakening, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and all that. We had a second great awakening all the way through D.L. Moody and the Layman's Prayer Revival. Had a first great awakening, second great awakening. Slavery remained legal through both. We need to do more than just have an emotional experience. We used to have a men's movement and promise keepers and a lot of emotional experience, but did that change? We need to have something that not only stirs the heart, but actually affects the head. And so in some respects, people say, what's going to happen with probe? We've already put 50 years of work in. We've done a lot of research and we have to now understand more and more about how to reach the generation Y, millennial generation, how to reach generation Z, and also the need for us to recognize that just because people are saved in their heart, many times they're not thinking biblically in their head. So I think we probably need probe ministries and summit ministries and uh, the Colson Center and a variety of others more than we've ever needed because we need to teach a whole new generation what a biblical worldview is. And if we are on the very edge of what could be another revival, and I hope it would be more than even that, we need to make sure people are not just stirred in their heart, but they're thinking biblically in their heads. Great. Thank you. There's a related one, but I'm going to skip it for a minute. Uh, how do we, one of our one of the people who's taking a course in Islam, uh, how do, and I don't know if you've written a book on that, how do we respond to a Muslim uh, promoting unity in religion? Yeah. Well, and again, I think um, we have a little booklet on Islam. Of course, I've written two books on Islam, but the bottom line is, is that we recognize that unity is important, and that is right now, because there's kind of a push to get the least common denominator, everybody will say, well, we're all basically looking for God in our own way. You ever heard somebody say, well, Christians and Muslims worship the same God? Well, first of all, if you're a true Muslim, you really don't believe that because the de character of the God of Islam is a distant, capricious, unknowing God. You don't know him. He reveals himself through his holy prophet Muhammad. He reveals himself through uh, the scriptures, the Quran, or through, um, you know, a number of other factors. But the reality is, is that uh, Islam has a belief in a uh, God who is the origin of both good and evil and it's uh, a distant relationship. Christianity worships a God that says we can call God what? Our Father. Just think of the uh, Lord's Prayer. What does it start up? Our Father. Uh, that almost sounds heretical to a Muslim. So on the one hand, you have some kind of secularized Muslims, and we have a mosque not far even from where the Hope Center is at Probe, in which you have some secular Muslims. They kind of talk about unity and everything, but that doesn't really work if you go back to the Orthodox teachings. It's like when I used to speak on college campuses more than I do. I remember one religion professor said, you know, I think all the religions are basically the same. You know, they're all seeking God. So I got up there and said, well, they're all basically the same. They only disagree on heaven, hell, God, salvation, a few other minor points. I was being facetious, you could tell, because they disagree. You know, either Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is not the Messiah. And of course, you can have Muslims say, well, we believe he's the Messiah, but we don't believe he was God. We don't. He was just a prophet. And so you can see you don't get unity there because you have contradictory statements being made. And if you look at all the religions, I'll broaden it just past Islam for a minute. Either God exists or God does not exist. If God exists, by definition, atheism, agnosticism or what? Wrong. Either God is personal or God is impersonal. If God is personal, by definition, the religions that talk about the impersonality of God, Hinduism, Buddhism would be what? Wrong. Either Jesus is the Messiah or Jesus is not the Messiah. So again, I recognize the desire for unity and there are some places where we can agree um, on the issue of creation evolution. I do know of some Muslim scientists that actually are working to prove evidence of intelligent design. I'll be glad to work with them, but I'm not going to compromise my theology over that. Does that make sense? Uh, so you can certainly recognize that there are some places and Muslims are against pornography. Well, I'll work with them to fight uh, the proliferation of pornography. But to say that we're unity is to deny the fundamental aspects of that. Christianity and Islam make diametrically different statements about God, about who Jesus is, about the resurrection, and a variety of others. 
topics. And so as a result, that's why as much as there's a push for unity from the secular Muslims, it just doesn't work because after all, a true Muslim is going to reject that. I understand that because they hold to their doctrines, the five pillars of Islam and the things that are part of the Quran. Great, thanks. You mentioned speaking on campus and uh, the professor, so that's going to tie into the next two questions. Uh, we've been seeing about the uh, reception at Stanford Law School and other uh, campus uh, events involving Turning Point and other ministries. Uh, are you still speaking on campus? What's happening on campus? And then a related one, uh, we hear our young people are leaving the church uh, and going to college and abandoning their faith. How do we stop that? Yeah. And again, we were on campus a lot more in the days when it was open, and that was because there used to be kind of the liberal mindset. And I can remember many a professor that would say, look, you know, uh, we're inviting Mr. Kirby Anderson here to speak in the classroom, because we speak actually in the actual classrooms themselves as part of what was called the Christian Update Forum. And he said, you've heard from me, so I thought at just one hour, uh, you might want to hear from an alternative point of view. And so I've spoken in government classes and science classes and history classes and philosophy classes, all sorts of things, as have many of our other staff members. But over time, the uh, liberal idea was giving way to a leftist idea. And one of the people I have on my program with some regularity is a man by the name of Dennis Prager. Some of you might know who he is. Uh, he's been in studio. By the way, we were telling some people how big he is. His shoulders come up like this. He is, he is really big. We have in our studio not only microphones, but we have cameras. And so because of that, we have lights. He hit every light walking in and out. Um, most of the time we have him by phone. But he's made a distinction, which I, th I agree with, between the left and liberals. You know, because we, I have, I've had Alan Dershowitz on our program a couple of times. He used to be with the ACLU. Well, he's a typical liberal, says, you know, you and I may disagree, but I have him on to talk about Israel. I had a former head of the ACLU on our program recently who was on the program to talk about the censorship of the left. And whether it's Jordan Peterson or Jonathan uh, Turley, uh, whether it's Joe Rogan, uh, even Bill Maher, these are your kind of liberals that are just can't believe leave the people on the left because what happens is on the campuses oftentimes now the left really prevents you from speaking at all. I was telling the story about when I was, uh, I think it was University of Central Florida, and when I spoke there, they um, piously said, well, if you speak, then we have to let a student come and speak and critique you. And I'm like, okay, we went up with that, but I'm not, but now they wouldn't even probably let me speak. So that's what is happening. We do have a chance sometimes to speak in evening meetings. Matter of fact, we have quite a bit of an outreach just locally, the University of Texas at Dallas, because we work with Ratio Christi and Reasonable Faith and things like that. But most of those are not in the classroom, but they're in evening meetings. And and interesting enough, the one that took place at Stanford and even the one that took place at Yale were actually not in the classroom. These were evening events or afternoon events. The one at Stanford, if you're not familiar with, is where an individual that I know pretty well, Judge uh, Kyle Duncan, who is in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, was invited by the Federalist Society to speak to the students at Stanford. And I was just reading today, because it's in the Wall Street Journal, so you can read his piece in the Wall Street Journal. When he shows up, there's posters and pictures. You know, this man is uh, against us, and he's taken away our rights, and he's anti-LGBTQ, which is not true. One of the nicest men you could ever met. Very quiet and kind of casual. He starts to speak and immediately there's cat calls and everything. And finally, just out of frustration, he says, is there an administrator here that can bring some kind of peace? And up comes the, the dean of DEI. What does that stand for? Diversity, equity, inclusion. And instead of telling him to calm down, just says, I, you know, we really hate what you say. I hate to say this to you, but you are causing a tear in this fabric. You're uh, not appreciated here. You're a hate person, you know. And it's like, what do you do when you can't control the uh, situation? And it's reminiscent of my alma mater at Yale because at Yale Law School, they had had one, which is, again, so typical in which you had Christian Wagoner, who is the current head of Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF, and then an uh, individual 
individual who I don't know as well, Mrs. Miller, who was a head of the American Humanist Association. And the premise was to bring a Christian and an atheist together to talk about, are there some common things that we can agree with? And yet that one was totally disrupted by, again, the Yale students. I guess they didn't get the memo that actually we can, even as atheists, agree with Christians and Christians could agree with atheists about at least the idea of not having censorship. They didn't get the memo, so they tried to censor it as well. Now, what was interesting is another professor I know um, who is actually in the D.C. Circuit Court said, well, now that we know who those students are, if any of them apply for federal internships, don't let them have them. Um, and that, that could be a real career stopping event. But the reality is, is it's just gotten out of hand. Even liberals, um, and again, you don't hear me quoting from Bill Maher too often, atheist agnostic saying, these people are crazy, you know, and Jordan Peterson and Jonathan Turley, you know, he's a professor of law at George Washington University Law School. And he's writing all the time in these various op-ed pieces in the Hill and for Forbes and Wall Street Journal about uh, just the insanity of the left. So I make a distinction between your liberals who, like us as Christians, would say, OK, make your case. Let well, me disagree. Uh, but the left say, no, you don't even have a right because it's moved from you are wrong to you are evil. And once you say, well, you're not just wrong, but you're evil, you don't deserve a place in the university. Do we get in occasionally? Yeah, get invited in. Pretty hostile, uh, but uh, we still are able to do the evening events or the afternoon events. But as you're seeing at Yale and at Stanford, they will show up even there. And when I was at the University of Central Florida, there was one guy going around and he was passing out flyers saying, these people are homophobic, Islamophobic, uh, and racist, you know. And of course, they say those kinds of things, so I'm not surprised. But I'm still pleased that a few years ago, yeah, I was able to speak. I'm not sure that's going to happen too much in the future unless we get a turnaround. And uh, since I'm in the state of Florida, I know you have a governor here. And he's been actually trying to bring some of those changes. But the other day, one of the people that was protesting the governor, Ron DeSantis, had a sign saying, uh, stay out of our university. And what struck me about that sign is, OK, our university. Think about this, young student. This university was built before you were born. The money for that university was paid before you even got out of diapers. And now you're claiming it is your university. And let's think about who actually pays for at least a public university. Taxpayers do. So again, there's a sense of arrogance and entitlement. And I think that's where we really need to kind of respond at that level and recognize that um, this is not something new. I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. I think most of you know I was born in Berkeley, California. My dad ran for the California Assembly in 1962, um, the same year that Richard Nixon ran for the governor. They both lost. Uh, he ran in 1964, um, the same year that Barry Goldwater ran for the presidency. They both lost. But then something happened in 1966. Ronald Reagan was elected governor and things changed dramatically. And Ronald Reagan, when he was elected, uh, at that time, there were students at the University of California at Berkeley that really wanted to disassociate the university system from that. But you couldn't do that because after all, he was willing to fight them. And if your tax dollars are going to that university, taxpayers have a right to talk about what is or is not taught at that university. Does it make sense? I believe in academic freedom, but when you're starting to teach Errors and lies and things that are harmful society, maybe we need to reevaluate some of that. So that's kind of where we are right now. But I'd love to go back on the university. It's a wonderful place to test your scholarship. It's a brutal place. I mean, I'm, I was at University of California at Boulder. Before we even go in the classroom, they took me out to a free speech platform. <laughs> I grew up in Berkeley. I hadn't seen a free speech platform in a long time. I'm up there, and the whole time I'm giving the gospel, there's one long-haired guy going, sit down, be quiet, 
Jesus Christ is a fascist. And I thought, well, that's, that's a university, but you know, we had a chance to present our view and then go into the classroom and mix it up and had one atheistic, uh, very feminist professor just tearing me apart, but okay, um, that's called free speech. You can have your speech, I can have mine, but it's not free speech when the moment you start speaking, as Judge Duncan found, he couldn't even finish his sentence without uh, people protesting and shouting them down. So something's gotta change because I believe that Christianity will thrive in a free environment, but it's hard to get those words out, which is why sometimes we find ourselves in um, YouTube timeout, which is where we are right now. <laughs> and follow up, how do we keep our church raised Christian yeah. students going to college? From right. abandoned um, that's a good one. You're going to love the endorsements. First of all, you guys uh, went your, you sent your kids to Summit Ministries, and um, that is a one two-week program in the summer. Um, it takes place in Colorado and a few other places, uh, Bryan College and the rest. We at Pro Ministries have one week, which we do in Denton, and we say we can accomplish, we think, as much in one week because what we do is we spend all our time with the students. We don't have the faculty sitting over here during lunch, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We actually sit with the students. We do role play. We do lots of uh, illustrations. Now there's time for ropes course and uh, getting out there in the lake and uh, all the rest and then the pond and the pools and all the things we've got. But the reality is, is we've got to do something to get them ready for what they're going to encounter. And again, I think there's a lot to be said about youth ministry and really preparing them for the future. I think when you're sitting around the table, if you've got young people or even if you're not a parent and you're now a grandparent, just asking questions and helping them find some answers and even what I gave you today about woke theology, I've given you some really good ammunition, really good uh, equipment, really good uh, tools, if you will, whatever illustration you want to use, so that you know how to answer some of those questions. But we really need to understand that uh, we can have a fun youth group. Matter of fact, I can't, Suzanne, I was trying to say, how many times have I had a pie face hit in my face? How many pizzas have we eaten at young uh, ministries, youth ministries? How many times have I had to put one of those surgical masks on your head and blow it up. You ever doing that? You know, they, they do all that stuff at camps and things like that. So I'm all about fun. You need to have fun when you're doing youth ministry. But we also need to say that in addition to fun, it's boot camp because you are sending them out to a world that is much more hostile than it used to be. And so we are convinced that uh, we can equip them with all sorts of great resources, including those booklets. You know, I write most of these booklets so you can read them in 10 minutes. What I say for some of the parents, well, I can't get them to read them. Put a $5 bill at the end of the booklet and say, you read these two booklets and you get that $5. You know, well, that gets their attention pretty quickly. Um, and they will begin to know there's another answer. Even if they don't know what the answer is, just to know there's another answer. And that's why we went into the classroom in the first place, because we were getting more and more frustrated that professors would stand up there uh, and claim that the Bible was wrong. And uh, yet we would bring in people that had academic credentials that were equal to, in many cases, superior to those individuals um, to give answers. And so uh, I, I can't even count the number of times Dr. Norm Geiser and I co did debates. You know, we would actually debate, uh, one time we debated the uh, executive ex editor of the Humanist Society, one of the leading evolutionists in the uh, state of Texas. I remember one time we were speaking at American Scientific Group, and we went through our book, Origin Science, and he went through his, and I went through mine. And of course, you know how Norm Geisler, you, you think I talk fast. I mean, he's just like a shumishian. And we had this one professor in Colorado stump, I said, I have never heard so much material in my whole life. But again, he'd never heard most of that either because they live in their little silos and they think that anybody that could possibly believe in creation must, you know, need a brain transplant or something of that nature. And so um, that is still something I'd love to do, but it's really getting even hard to do debates on campus. So let's pray for that. But most important, let's prepare these young people. Uh, we have the best arguments. And my argument that I'm making right now now, as we really do in our 50th anniversary, is probe was really needed back in 1973. Um, it was needed because we didn't have that many answers. If you talk about people doing apologetics, well, that was Josh McDowell, sort of Norm Geisler. Worldview, that was like Francis Schaeffer, not too many other people, a couple others like that. 
Now we just have this abundance. We just mentioned all these different people doing apologetics and all sorts of people doing worldview. But you know, back in 1973, we weren't talking about transgenderism, were we? And we weren't uh, saying that, well, you have your truth and I have my truth and someone else has a different truth. And uh, we weren't uh, actually saying that uh, individuals don't even believe should have a hearing because they have the wrong skin color. So if we needed it in 1973, I think we need what we're doing now in 2023 even more. And the good news is, is even though I'm one of the oldest on staff, we've got some real young people coming up behind us that have been trained on this area of worldview and apologetics and are really making a difference. And I'm ready to turn them loose and see what can happen. Are, are we living in the days of Noah? <laughs> I hate to think. We, does everybody agree with that? You know, in the days of Noah, it's just as in the days of Noah. And, the, and, and again, let's recognize that certainly God could come back before we finish today. And after what you've heard today, aren't you ready? Uh, but the bottom line is he could come back hundreds of years from now. I don't think so. Um, Suzanne's one of those people I always jokingly said it's hard for her to buy green bananas because, you know, we're really close. <laughs> She, that's her joke, you know. But the bottom line is, is yes, we recognize that there are some things like that. And so if you go back, Matthew 24, it does seem like that. But I also recognize that there have been other people that were absolutely convinced they were on the edge of the return of Christ. And you look at, for example, why there was even this idea of having um, the Crusades is there was an individual, a Muslim, that was putting Christians to death, who was controlling the economy, and he looked kind of like he might have been the Antichrist. And that's in 1090, you know, so that's the case. And there were people that have always wondered, are we actually at the very edge of the return of Christ? Uh, you start seeing, you know, rumors of war, wars and rumors of war. You see the increase in earthquakes. And, and there have always been earthquakes, there have always been wars, but you do see some things which are pretty unprecedented. Even in the worst of the Roman Empire, you didn't have legalized homosexuality. It was just tolerated. It was many things that were tolerated at the time. We have it legalized in this country. And so you begin to say, well, we certainly could be, but even so, we need to be planning for the future. You know, Martin Luther one time was asked, well, if Christ were to return, what would you do? He said, well, if Christ were to return tomorrow, I'd still plant a tree today and pay my debts because I do not know. And so we are to be certainly occupying till he's come not preoccupied with his coming. Now, that being said, boy, it sure looks like a dark time. And we've seen other dark times. We were talking about that in the Middle Ages and uh, certainly all sorts of other issues. And it was pretty dark, quite frankly, before the First Great Awakening. And yet the First Great Awakening gave us the American Revolution. And then it kind of got dark again after the American Revolution. And then you have revivals breaking out at Yale and Oberlin. Hard to imagine that happening today uh, in all sorts of other places. And you have all sorts of evangelistic opportunities that developed. So who knows? But it certainly is a dark time. Great opportunity for us to shine some light in a dark culture. That's my answer to that question. Uh, I was asked to have you read your introduction to uh, a book called Richard Rohr and the Enneagram Secret. So you wrote an introduction <laughs> to this, if you would look at that sure. and uh, maybe read it and then comment on the book or the fellow brother, sister involved in that. Right. And again, this uh, are, is some research that was done. You may have heard about anagrams. People say, I'm a four or whatever, you know, whatever number they are. And again, I understand people wanting to try to understand their characteristics. You know, you've heard people be uh, saying, well, I'm a D-I-S-C, or I'm a lion, a golden retriever, or whatever. You know, you've heard that. So I understand people kind of want to understand their personality. But one of the things that I appreciate Don Vino, who contacted me about doing the endorsement, is that he, as well as Marsha Montenegro, and these are individuals who have been associated with the seminary there uh, that was started by Norm Geisler and others, um, are really concerned. And so, again, they thought, maybe I just read this and if you if you'd like a copy of the book I guess somebody here has one I've got one if you want to borrow one and we're thinking about doing an inter a whole interview with the two of them on we just haven't been able to pull it together but the Enneagram is an attempt to really try to peg you but a lot of it comes from Eastern ideas so anyway 
thought I'd read my introduction. This is what I said. It's funny to read yourself. Uh, false ideas are one of the greatest obstacles to the gospel and can lead to even Orthodox Christians astray. Most Christians can identify some of those false ideas, Marxism, humanism, evolution, the New Age movement, but few would be able to list the Enneagram as a false and dangerous idea. Richard Rohr and those whom he has mentored are spreading this idea. That's the individual they're talking about right here. Um, and uh, this is why the book is so important. It's a warning to Christians who might adopt it into their theology, and it's an obstacle to non-Christians who accept its teachings rather than the truth of the gospel. Um, if you, uh, you know, take the test and say, well, uh, whatever number I am, does that mean you're non-Christian? No, I'm not going to go that far. But the problem is, is when you start spreading false ideas, then I think you have a problem. So nevertheless, if you say, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, you can get a copy of the book. If you do, let me recommend the book, because I think they do set forth the case in a fairly cogent way to point out how some of these ideas have made their way into the church. And since I've picked enough battles today about woke theology, I won't pick another one other than to simply say, it, if indeed we are in the days of Noah, back to that previous one, it's going to be even more important for us to have what? Discernment, you know, and the scriptures talk about discernment quite often. As a matter of fact, if you look at the original Hebrew word, which you see many times in Proverbs or in the New Testament, the Greek word, oftentimes the word discernment is translated as other things like sound mind or thought or clear. So if you actually go back and find it, you see that the scriptures are replete with examples calling for us to have discernment. And if that was true in the first century, how much more true is it in the 21st century? Again, if I can borrow my background in Berkeley, there's a group that's at uh, what's called the Spiritual Counterfeits Project, which was very strong in Berkeley, not so much strong now, but they had done an uh, estimate and they said within about a 10 mile radius of Berkeley, California, they were able to identify every major religion and cult that has ever existed on this planet. Now, you might say, well, that means I don't want to go to Berkeley. No, because those ideas spread. You always heard, you know, what happens in Las Vegas stays in Las Vegas. Maybe so. I don't believe it. But I'll guarantee you what happens in California does not stay in California. It's spread very quickly by cell phones and social media and by uh, just a mobile society. So those ideas are all over the culture. A lot of them have found their home on college campuses, which is another reason why you really need to prepare your children and grandchildren for what they're going to encounter on campus. Why are people okay with Marxism but not communism? <laughs> yes, uh, and that's a good one because if there's anything we talked about, we talked about Antonio Gramsci, they recognize that if you say communism, there's a natural reaction to that. Now more for those of you that are older. Those of you that have gray hair or no hair at all, you can remember I say communism, you think Russia. But the reality is for the younger generation, you say Marxism and they say, well, Venezuela or, you know, maybe a Latin American country. Argentina toyed with that. And they go, well, that sounds right. Or Marxism, well, they, they, we have socialist economies. We have Sweden and Denmark and everything. By the way, as you might imagine, I have a booklet on Christianity and socialism, one on capitalism and socialism. And then I did just one on socialism because I recognize that a lot of young people do have that idea. They say, no, no, we're not communists. We're just Marxist or we're just socialist. And socialist sounds good. Because, again, what they'll do is they'll say, well, actually, the Bible teaches socialism. Because let's go here. Let's look at Acts 4. You know, we see that it said that they had all sorts of things that were held in common. They skip over Acts 5 where it talks about Ananias and Sapphira. Uh, but nevertheless, the bottom line is they say, well, yeah, so actually the Bible teaches socialism. And so that's why in my booklet on socialism, we and actually have a chapter in one of my books, we document all the socialist experiments. And you don't have to take my word for it. Dinesh D'Souza has a list and he pulls from other people's list. And it's possible to say they're probably in round numbers about two dozen or more major countries that have tried socialism and every single one of them has been a disaster. 
Now, if you talk about those that flirt with socialism, now you're up to about four dozen, but again, hasn't been very strong. And then lots of times we'll say, yeah, but look at Sweden, it's socialist. And I uh, brought on the other day, a, socialist, a former socialist historian from Sweden who said, we're not socialists now. Yeah, we used to be, and it was a disaster. We're probably more free market than you are in the United States now. Uh, so again, they think that um, socialism or Marxism is acceptable, and they never see that that is the same, basically, as communism. Again, in classical Marxism, since I had to read Karl Marx, Karl Marx would argue that when we went from kind of feudalism into the Industrial Revolution, we came to capitalism. And this allowed the greatest flourishing of human activity and entrepreneurship. But his argument is, in its success, we're sown the very seeds of its failure. That is, capitalism is going to fail because capitalism makes people greedy and ambitious. And so what would happen eventually is capitalism would give way to socialism. And as a result, we would then have the means of production actually held in common. And once we move towards that, it would create the Marxist new man. That is, you change the cultural base, you change the cultural superstructure, and it makes us a different kind of human being. And there would no longer be ambition, there would no longer be greed, and eventually we'd move towards material communism. There wouldn't even be government. Each would produce according to their ability, and each would receive according to their need. Does that sound familiar? By the way, when we asked university students recently where they came from, they said, Declaration of Independence. No, <laughs> it comes from the Communist Manifesto, but everybody, well, that's a sad commentary there. It's well. And so the problem with that, just from a Christian point of view, is this. Human beings are sinful. Are human beings going to be sinful in the future? Is it possible to make a new Marxist man? No, it's not. And so I think a wise person would make sure you wouldn't want that. And so what I oftentimes say to students that say, well, I, I think Marxism or socialism is really the better model. I say, so you don't have any problem with all people telling you what to do. <laughs> the reaction is, oh, no, I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. Have you looked at any of these socialist economies? We in a so-called capitalist society, although we're not all that capitalist anymore, have the government telling you what to do all the time. What do you think happens in a socialist economy? The government tells you what to do all the time. And so as a result, I found that's a really good talking point with them. They don't want to be told what to do, but they somehow think socialism is kind of fair. But um, they don't really want to be told what to do. They don't want a bureaucrat to tell them what to do. They certainly don't want an unelected bureaucrat to tell them what to do, and that's exactly what happens under socialism. That's the road to serfdom, if I can quote from another book. Reminds me of these young kids I sometimes meet uh, as they're graduating, and I uh, said, well, you're going to go off to college? Well, I'm not so sure I want to go to college, but I'm tired of getting out of this house because I am tired of my parents telling me what to do. So I said, what are you going to do? I'm going to join the Marines. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you, they really will tell you what to do now. And it's the same thing. These kids that say, oh, we think socialism is great. Once you start explaining to them what it would be like to have an unelected bureaucrat telling you what to do, that sort of backs them off pretty quickly. And that's been one of the more effective talking points that I found. Any others? Come go all day, I guess. <laughs> well, what, what time? I'm not going yeah. anywhere other than right. just driving. Just a couple, couple more quickly. Okay. Uh, what... What impact does, really the question is, what about chat, GBT, and how does it interact with our faith and maybe technology generally on a broader? Okay, okay first of all, you've got to think he was speaking in tongues. What's chat, GDP, right? Okay, this is artificial intelligence. First of all, I will show a bias. My son-in-law just wrote a book on the subject. Interestingly enough, it's called Machine Intelligence, and it's a really good book. Um, he's got an IQ of 180, so the book is almost impenetrable. So let me just first of all warn you that if you get the book, it's just pretty technical. But that being said, we now have these supercomputer artificial uh, intelligence kinds of devices, and uh, these are able to now do all sorts of things. Um, I've understood that they've been able to take the bar exam and pass it. They've been able to write memos. They've been able to write articles. And so why wouldn't be before that? Well, because I did put myself through graduate school programming computers. And when I programmed computers, I learned a very simple principle called GIGO. What's that? Garbage in, 
garbage out. Now, there have been some people that have been feel, uh, feel, playing around with some of these uh, chat GBTs and said, okay, if I tell you to not deal with the constraints put on you, because some of the constraints are political correctness. In other words, we don't want you really to think outside the box, so we're going to put you in a, can I tell you, it's sort of like a liberal secular box, um, that then when they free them from that, they come up with different answers. So again, some of this has to do with the fact that they wanted to give them constraints because they don't want to come up with just wildly radical ideas. Um, if I still had my computer on and I'd, I'd loaded it, I've shown you over the years that some of these TED talks about the, the best way to allocate resources, uh, for example, in a container facility or whatever, and when you don't put any constraints on it, you come up with these really bizarre things that wouldn't work because they aren't constrained by the laws of physics. So you can see that obviously if you want to have artificial intelligence, it needs to have some of the same constraints that we as human beings have. We recognize that we actually live in space and time and things of that nature. Well, they put those constraints on so they don't come up with ideas that might be racist or might involve disinformation or misinformation. See where I'm going with this? That's the concern that people have. Are these effective? Unbelievably so. Because imagine having a computer that can collect all sorts of data and then make wise decisions. My daughter's trying to get me to right now invest in this one place where artificial intelligence is making judgments about stocks in the stock market. Well, it's one thing for you to have a little bit of data to make a prudent judgment about a stock, it's quite another to let every possible input, um, which would be far beyond what your you know, limited brain, especially as we get older, sometimes they don't, that brain doesn't work quite as well as it used to. But again, there's some tremendous benefits to that. But are there also some tremendous downsides? And probably the biggest issue, and I'm going to be writing some commentaries on it, and you pretty much convinced me now it's about time to do a booklet on artificial intelligence um, and some of the strengths, but also some of the concerns about that. So pay attention. Uh, there's some good articles that have appeared in um, National Review and the Wall Street Journal. I think there have been some in Forbes that have actually pointed out a few of the biases of those computer programs. Does that mean you don't use it? No. I mean, I think wise and discerning people want to use that. But they have found that when we take the constraints away, we get different kinds of answers. So it shows you that sometimes garbage in, garbage out. Sometimes the biases of the program programmers end up giving you some conditions of what finally will come once you get the output. And so, pretty powerful. Again, some people said, if we go down this road, will the AIs take over? Well, now we're into the matrix, right? Aren't we? Okay, so we don't want to go to the matrix, but uh, there are some obvious benefits from computer technology, especially these supercomputers, which were able to do so many things that we could never do before. And uh, one more example, I'll leave it at that. Even just with the minimum minimal amount of computers. When we were at Yale, Suzanne worked in the biology department, and Dr. Ruddle at that time worked long and hard to map like one gene on the chromosome, on the human chromosome, because they were trying to map genes on the human chromosome. And it took hours and years to try to get one gene located on one of our DNA strands. Once we developed supercomputers, we'd be able to now map the entire human genome. So sometimes computers are able to do things which we could never have imagined doing before. But again, I think you just have to be wise. It's just a tool. It's just a technology. Technology can be used for very good things. Technology can be used for very evil kinds of things. And the sad reality is the more those technologies being developed and then end up in the hands of like people in China or Russia, the more I think they could be used to really subjugate the people, and we should be concerned about that aspect as well. But I'll put it on a booklet, and if you're on the pro mailing list, you'll see that coming to you on a regular basis. Any more? Yeah, two more. What is contemplative prayer, oh, yes. and do you have a view on that? We've done a couple of interviews on contemplative prayer. Again, you have to be careful because this is a classic illustration. You saw me today. What is woke and what is not woke? What is contemplative prayer? A lot of people say, well, look, I'm going to con uh, really contemplate God's word. Um, a good illustration. Let's take it out of prayer for a minute. You've heard people say, I meditate on the Bible. 
Does the Bible tell you to meditate on Scripture? Yes, it does. Do we have people that meditate Eastern? Yes. What's the difference? Okay. When you meditate on God's Word, you're meditating on content. And so you're reflecting on God's Word and what it means. And so that kind of scriptural meditation is something that is not only allowed, it's encouraged in Scripture. That's very different than Eastern meditation, where the idea is I want to put myself into sort of a passive, open-minded kind of idea. And as a result, that will result in me open myself up to spiritual entities. Is that dangerous? Yeah, I go back to the Spiritual Counterfeits Project or Watchman Fellowship. They've documented some of that as well. Some great ministries that have pointed out some of the spiritual dangers. Same thing, contemplative prayer. We've done a program or two on that. I just mentioned Watchman Watchman Fellowship. That's watchman.org. They have a very good article on contemplative prayer, but you have to define it because can I, uh, in prayer, uh, contemplate God's goodness? contemplate God's attributes. Yeah, there's some wonderful books that have just come out in the last couple of years about uh, com com contemplating what God might be due. But that's very different than what is kind of more of a Roman Catholic, almost monastic kind of contemplative prayer. So I would make a distinction there. But if you'd like to read some Watchman Fellowship, or if you say, I'd like to just hear what a person has written a book on it says go to pointofview.net we have a search engine type in prayer contemplative prayer you can listen to the interview uh, again it's kind of like this one where when you got an individual who's done their whole life's work on it i'll let them speak rather than me when i've only kind of scanned through the book and so i'll turn it over to those individuals but there are some concerns but define it carefully because certainly we should be praying and we can pray back scripture to god we can certainly contemplate God's mercy, his awesomeness, and all the rest. That's different than what we're talking about that is starting to have a, a little bit of a following in some of these more liberal churches, which we need to avoid. Final question. Do you have any view on the impending arrest of former President <laughs> Trump? <laughs> yes, he keeps saying he's going to be arrested on Tuesday. I just read something this morning and said, don't know if that's going to happen, but we will see. It will be an interesting uh, year because there's still a high percentage of people that uh, said they would uh, uh, vote for Donald Trump. Now, if he's arrested and they're going to give him a perk walk, I don't think it's going to happen, but who knows? I've given up trying to make predictions. Back in 2016, I predicted who I thought would be the president candidate and it wasn't Donald Trump matter of fact it wasn't in the top two or three so you know I'm giving up trying to talk about that but it will be interesting because we have a phenomenon that has never happened before first of all a president running who's been impeached what twice a president who has been indicted at least twice, or depend on if you want to count some of the previous ones, almost 10 times, if you really take all the small indictments, it's the first time we've had a president in modern history that's run against his cabinet. Think about this, you know, uh, it, it, because he will possibly run against Mike Pence. By the way, let me recommend whether you like Mike Pence or not. His new book is really a very good book. He's also running against Nikki Haley. I, I know about the book, have not read that one. And he's also running against Mike Pompeo. And I have read that book and had Mike Pompeo on a couple of times. So that's kind of unusual. You know, you have three individuals that were part of your cabinet running against you in the primaries. So it will be kind of interesting, especially when you think of Mike uh, Pompeo, probably doesn't have a chance of being elected, but if he were nominated, would be the most talented person for the presidency ever. I mean, again, goes to West Point, first in his class, okay? Uh, then goes into the military, then becomes a member of Congress out of Kansas, then out of that becomes the CIA director, and then becomes the Secretary of State. I mean, we've never, I mean, the closest would be George Herbert Walker Bush, who was CIA director and ambassador to China. And it's a sad commentary that somebody that talented and really a very nice individual, I've gotten to know him a little better because I've interviewed him a couple of times, um, again, would be great. Maybe he'll be in somebody's cabinet because he really brings a lot to the table in that regard. We had him come and speak at our church at Prestonwood. Uh, Suzanne always likes me to tell the story. And so that's when he was speak, uh, Secretary of State. And so he comes with an entourage of individuals around him. And at one point, one of the people in the choir
choir went back to the choir loft, and all of a sudden they see a man who's sitting there with a rifle. It's got a night scope on it, <laughs> and he's just watching the congregation in case anybody tries to rush uh, the Secretary of State while he's speaking at Prestonwood. Which I think, again, maybe pray for some of these individuals. Can you imagine everywhere you go, somebody has to be with you? Why? Because it's quite possible that somebody um, that would disagree with you would take you out or a Muslim terrorist would take you out. I think John Bolton, I think he has a security detail as well because they've done that. Um, I'll end with this. John Bolton. I don't know if you know the story. John Bolton was in the law school with Clarence Thomas. Everybody know who Clarence Thomas is? Clarence Thomas, when he went to law school, he was really pretty much a card-carrying Democrat because all his family had been Democrats, and he was really a card-carrying liberal. He was kind of the liberal's liberal. And he and John Bolton struck up a relationship because John Bolton was willing to talk to him about all sorts of things, whether it's sports or uh, philosophy, whatever. And so here you got John Bolton at the time, pretty conservative even then, and Clarence Thomas, about as liberal as they come, and they were having conversations. And one day, you know, um, Clarence was given the whole argument about why we need more government and we need to have government and more bureaucrats and all this kind of stuff. And John Bolton stopped and said, Clarence, I just want to ask you a question. You've told me before the stories of your family and the way in which your father, first your grandfather, then your father, and you were mistreated in the Deep South. And you had Jim Crow laws, and you had all sorts of persecution and all the rest. And so you obviously were maltreated, poorly treated by people in the government. Why are you actually talking about giving government more power? Clarence Thomas stopped in his tracks, and it was like a light went on, and you know what Clarence Thomas is today. So if you wonder about Clarence Thomas's uh, conservatism, you can maybe ask uh, and thank John Bolton for a question that turned his mind around. Which, back to our point, sometimes we can turn a conversation with our friends, neighbors, co-workers, and family members, sometimes with just a question. And that was a question that changed the whole political philosophy of Clarence Thomas. Anyway, enough of those stories. I'll let you get uh, back to uh, going home and enjoying this day. Can we give a uh, hand to Kirby? <laughs> Thank you so much for staying, for Suzanne for coming and putting up with this. Uh, for those of you whose questions I wrote down, I hope I did it rough justice. Uh, remember on the last point, if you look in the New Testament, how many times did Jesus ask questions? How many times? Just ask more questions than he gave answers a lot of time because that would bring everything out. Uh, whom do you say that I am? Uh, that's the important question. And uh, I'm the resurrection and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Believest thou this? And so that's the question. Do you believe that today? I hope all of you do. Uh, we will see you uh, next week. And uh, again, thanks for the potluck and have a great rest of the day.